a seat, find a sheet, open your Bibles, all those things. Good to see everyone this morning. Special welcome to those of you that are greeting us online from the, uh, the comfort of your living rooms. I pray it's warm and cozy. It's nice and warm in here. Feels good. Uh, a lot of body heat in here. we got a full house again. Good to have everyone together. Uh, it is good to come together and study God's Word. This is what equips us. Uh, this is what sends us. And uh, uh, this is what strengthens us. And so we never want to avoid opportunities to be in the Word of God, whether it's individually letting God grow us or corporately as we come together uh, as the body of believers. So uh, just a reminder for our collections, uh, both our, our pennies uh, as well as for our seminarians, uh, make sure you separate those two and uh, uh, feel free to uh, support that as, as God moves you to. In front of you, you should have uh, vocation number five as, uh, as we continue on with this study that we're really looking at that really talks about how God loves people through us. And, and that really is God's plan. And, uh, and I say this often, there is no plan B. This is how God plans to um, impact this world is through his church. It's why he gave us life. It's why he gave us faith. It's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. Those things are investments that God has given us. In fact, he even says that. I've given you these things as a down payment for one day when you would be in heaven. But we don't just sit and do nothing until Jesus comes back. He didn't say that when he sent it back to heaven. Hey, don't do anything until I get back. Right? Instead, he said, go. Make disciples baptizing. Right? And, and so that's us loving this world. And, and Love, there is nothing more important than showing God's love to a world. Now, that looks in, in a variety of ways, depending on the, the circumstance. We often think that love is just this blanket embrace of no matter what or who you come across. Not true. Uh, I want you to think about if, if, you, uh, if you're a half-decent parent. I'm not asking for a show of hands. But if you're a half-decent parent at one time in your life, loving your kids Sometimes meant discipline, sometimes meaning tough, sometimes meaning comforting. Um, but love is, is specifically pointing towards something that is better, not just this blanket embrace uh, of everything that happens. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. All right? So, uh, here's a quote from Go Gustav Wingreen. Uh, I touched on him the other day a little bit, uh, uh, the last week or two weeks ago. Vocation is earthly. Just as shockingly earthly as the humanity of Christ. Apparently so devoid of all divinity. Apparently, not really. In the crucifixion of Christ, the divine nature was only hidden, not absent. It was present in the lowly form of love for robbers next to him and soldiers below him. Similarly, God conceals his work of love to men in cross-marked vocation which is really of benefit to the neighbor. So what we're talking about, uh, and what I'm going to touch on today, is how God is hidden within us, but not unknown. All right, and That's going to be kind of a, a dichotomy understanding today, and that'll make some more sense, but Wingreen kind of gets us started. So let me begin by this, this fact. God is intimately involved uh, in his creation, or with his creation, I think would be more of a, uh, of a partnership with what he's made. Intimately involved. Uh, he, is, he is interested in everything that goes on. The reason that this planet continues to spin is because God himself is mindful of it. He did not start everything moving and then steps away. He is not absent uh, as the creator. You and I exist today because God has you in mind. If God were to stop thinking about you, considering you, you would cease to exist. Right? So the very thing of life, in fact, what uh, scientists cannot do is they cannot define life. They can describe the activities that life produces, the biochemistry, uh, the electro neuro uh, activities within cells and organelles and things like that. But what they cannot define is life. I can, right? Uh, it is God. God is the source of all life. It doesn't mean there's this mysterious glow within cells or things like that, but that you cannot reduce it all the way to the source of this is life. And that's what God is and, and how he is intimately involved with this creation. 
Now, when we think about his involvement with creation, God is spirit, but chooses to deal with his creation, which is physical. Okay? So, what are God's options? Right? Not that he is defined by nature. He dictates nature. He created nature. But when he chooses to interact with a physical matter um, creation, then there also needs to be a physical interaction. So it's one of the reasons the incarnation. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. That God became flesh. Why? So he could interact with us so that he could take our place. But that's part of it. The reason that God made himself manifested through a birdie bush or a column of smoke or a pillar of fire for the children of Israel. Um, or sometimes in the Old Testament, we'll use that phrase, son of man, right? Where God appears in human form. That's his way of interacting. Uh, in fact, even the language that he shared with Moses and says, tell people this, when he writes Genesis, Exodus, and so forth. I used it this morning in the sermon, you guys, if you were there, I talked about how God said in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, that God spoke spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. An amazing thing. Now, does God have lips and a mouth and a tongue and teeth? No. Right? He is not restricted by that, but in order for you and I to understand it, he tells Moses, who wrote Genesis, to write this down so that we understand. When God said, you are to refer to me as Father, does that mean that God, the Father, has a gender? No, he doesn't have a change. He's not restricted by, uh, you know, being a homo sapien, right? He's not human. But he says, in relationship, I want you to think of me as father. And we're like, well, what does father mean? Look around you. We have fathers, okay? And, and so that's why. And, and, and so God really wants to interact with us. But because he is divine, spiritual, he is uh, endless and he is eternal, he cannot interact with the physical of creation without manifesting himself in some way. One of the main ways is you and I, right? We are the physical embodiment of God. That's why he gave us his image. His image is not a gift to us so that we one day go to heaven. It's involved, but if that's the reason he gave it to us, then why are we all still here? If he said, I want to give you the tickets, punch your ticket, so to speak, through my image to be in heaven one day and give you the gift of faith, then why are we still here? Because we have a job to do. And that job is to be the physical manifestation of God to this world. Uh, it'll make sense. Um, God's modus operandi, abbreviated MO, right? God's MO is to use the ordinary to accomplish the extraordinary. I touched on this last week. All right? So God uses the ordinary. Welcome to the club. All right? We are ordinary. Okay? And we, we spend way too much time patting ourselves on the back sometimes. It's actually uh, more effective, I believe, to look to God and be able to go, I am ordinary. Um, if you were in the early service, going to the late service, you'll hear it, the Old Testament reading. God comes to Jeremiah, a boy, and says, I have chosen you to be a prophet to my people. And he's like, me? I'm a boy. I can't even speak very well. And God goes, don't tell me you can't speak very well. I will give you the words to say. I will send you. And what I tell you to do, you're going to do it, right? Because I am the one working through you. I am going to use your vocation as a prophet and speak through you so that people hear the message, right? That's my plan. Now, you and I can sit here and debate it and argue it and, you know, argue with God and kind of go, I don't want to be a, a representative of you. You can go ahead and do that if you choose. Just so you know, he's the God of the universe. Don't know if that's a good gamble or not to be able to say, I don't want to do this. Okay? Um, if, if you need a reminder, read the story about Jonah. Right? He could have taken a camel to Nineveh. I always say. So, some of the ways that God does the, uh, takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. One is Jesus, the incarnation. When you looked at Jesus, what did you see? God. Man. You probably saw man. You, he was God, you're right. But what would you have seen? He didn't have, uh, although the, the artists often do this, right? Head glows, this radiant aura around him, and he's always just kind of standing like this, right? And, and so forth. Uh, if you would have seen Jesus, you would have said, Jewish guy, Jewish man. In fact, in Isaiah, it actually says, not even that good looking. And I'm not being irreverent. I'm just saying, he was a normal, ordinary guy. So when he came in and people are like going, Messiah, Hosanna to the highest. And they looked at him like, him? 
Right? This guy, I mean, he should be on a horse. He should be arraigned in, in, in royal garb and so forth. And he's, he's riding a donkey and he's, some people are even saying he's a carpenter. Carpenter, right? I mean, he's kind of blue collar. He's simple. He's ordinary. And yet God does the extraordinary. This morning, I don't know if you came to early service or you're coming to late service. If you take the Lord's Supper, you know what I put in your hand? Bread. It's what it looks like. What's there? Body. Right? But it's not just body. It's still bread. They're both there. Completely. Just like Jesus was completely man, completely God at the same time. But the ordinary and the extraordinary. Your vocation. You are not ordinary. Not with God. By yourself, absolutely ordinary. You're regular, normal, simple. And yet with God through you, extraordinary. Sometimes even miraculous. That's his plan. His plan is to take ordinary things and do extraordinary things. I, I was amazed. I was reading uh, Exodus. Uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into Exodus for Lent and uh, kind of look at the promises of God uh, and so forth through Exodus and kind of walk through this a little bit. And uh, I'm always amazed at what God did through his people, whether it's Elijah, Elisha, Moses, um, Abraham. Take simple little things, right? Moses, go up to the Red Sea and hold your staff up, a stick, and watch what happens. Right? Take your stick and hold it up. Red Sea just parts. Ordinary stick. Right? Moses, go to Pharaoh and uh, tell him to let my people go. And then throw your staff down on the ground. And that staff becomes a serpent. Right? It's a stick. It's just a normal stick. Okay? God uses ordinary all the time. And I tell you that so that, that encourages us as ordinary people that God intends to use us as well. So, if God is incarnational... And he is. I'm not saying if, like we're wondering if he is, but the qualifier. If God is incarnational, it says in Philippians 2, 5, and 7, you can look that up if you want, then he is also evangelical. If God comes in the flesh, he is coming to reach us. That's the point of the incarnation. He's not bored in the throne room of God. And he's like, I'd like to go down and walk around in my creation a little bit. He comes to us because there is a purpose. And that purpose is evangelism, right? Euangelion, that connection in Greek, that connection to people in the body. So if he is incarnated, right? Carnus, carnal, that's flesh. If he is uh, incarnated, then there must be a purpose. And that purpose is to reach and impact this world. And since we are the only ones with a mind and an ability to comprehend and exist eternally, then that purpose involves us. It doesn't just involve the trees and the mountains and the streams and the animals. That's God's creation. But he doesn't redeem them, right? They don't have souls. They don't have eternal um, uh, comp components, so to speak, like we do. So if God is incarnational, then he is also evangelical. And if he is evangelical reaching people, then that means that he is also historical. And what I mean by that is that God was a person in time. He had matter and mass and he took up space and he had a temperature and he spoke and he listened and he walked and he talked uh, and so forth. He existed a real life person. In fact, most of the time, if you have a debate with someone and they're arguing with whether or not God exists in the person of Jesus Christ and so forth, what most historians cannot argue with is that Jesus existed. Jesus of Nazareth. It is not, and it's a terrible phrase, it is not blind faith on the part of a believer to believe that Jesus once walked this earth. Blind faith is actually a really poor statement, right? God never calls us to just have um, perceptionless um, ability, uh, 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 sense less, sense hyphen less, um, not using the senses that he's given you to perceive his existence. It's, it's clear that Jesus walked this earth. Now, for you to make then that, that, that next statement that he is the very son of God, that takes a little more discussion. And it's going to take some trust in some things like the word of God, like people's eyewitness accounts and things like that. What you have a real hard time discussing is do you believe that Jesus died on the cross. Almost every historian would go, even sources outside the Bible, what we call extra biblical sources, they would say, yeah, there's records of it. Jesus of Nazareth um, died on the cross by the Roman hand. Okay, And what happened a few days later? Several hundred people witnessed him walking around. 
It's really hard to debate, historically speaking. Now, I say this because we're going to come back to this, that there is a very pragmatic fact and truth about Christ incarnated, right, flesh acting out the love of God to the neighbors, the people uh, in this world. And so therefore, if he is historical and you and I are also at this time and place made up of bodies and gifts and abilities and things like that, we too carry out the vocation the same way that Jesus does. I'll get to that. If he is evangelical, then it also that he is also sacramental. Jesus is sacramental. Um, what we say in two of the, our two sacraments, Lord's Supper and baptism, is that Jesus Christ delivers what to us? What do we call that? We get it in both of the, of the sacraments. What does he deliver to us? Big word, real important for all of us. Salvation. Begins with G, ends in race. Grace. Grace. Well done. Excellent. Good. Right. Sorry. I know I lead you down there. You're like, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz today. Right? So it delivers. They're means of grace. They're ways by which God communicates. Now, Jesus is obviously the one um, that delivers grace. His, his life, death, and resurrection, that's what provides grace. And so him being sacramental, he gives of his very body and blood. We just celebrated that in the Lord's Supper. And we do it every time we come together. That's why it's so important for us to remind one another to say those words. This is not just bread and wine. This is not a placebo. I say it every Sunday. This is not just a reminder. This is not just a reference uh, or some, some kind of understanding, as some believe that it is. Because some other Christian churches, some other denominations, they just struggle wrapping their heads around how is it possible that the very body of Christ, the very blood of Christ is present every time we come together in every church around the world that claims it. How is it possible? Can't you run out? All right, are there limits? Is God himself, Jesus, is he finite? No. He's also divine. And so every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, it is sacramental because Jesus gives of himself, right? And he gives of himself in love. And that's how we are to receive it. All right, we'll keep going. And so, since we've been talking about this, since he is incarnational, that therefore he is evangelical, he's also vocational. Jesus lived out his vocation, not just, even though it's hugely important, as Christ, as the Messiah. Those are the same terms, by the way. Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew. And so even though he is vocational, here's what we learn. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4.15, please. Somebody read that nice and loud. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we talk about one of Jesus' vocations, one of the ways that he acts on our behalf is as a priest, right? He is the greatest priest, right? Part of the reason that we have in the church pastors, preachers, Priests, whatever we want to call them, is because we are following the model, the example, the vocation of Jesus himself. Which is often why we say, uh, in, the, in the stead of Christ, I say this to you, not from me, right? Like when I forgive your sins on a Sunday morning, it is not Eric forgiving your sins. You're doomed if that's the case. You get up to heaven one day and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? You're like, Pastor Eric forgave my sins. He'll say, can you please move to the back of the line and think about what you just said? <laughs> now, that's going to be a big line, so you don't want that to happen, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus did. That's, that, I, get to, I get to speak uh, uh, by his empowerment, by his authority. So as we see this, we understand there is a pattern of intimacy through the vocation. Jesus demonstrates through the vocation of being prophet, priest, and king, we talk about those things as identities of Christ, that those things are here um, demonstrated by Christ to interact with us. As a king, that's the amazing thing about Jesus. As a king, he didn't come in a, in a palace uh, on a throne and that's where he stays. He didn't even just stay in the synagogue or the temple and say, if you want anything from me, uh, uh, from one o'clock till four o'clock on Saturdays, I'll be available, right? What did Jesus do? Went out to the people. And not only out to the people, he went and had dinner with sinners. 
Now, I know that everyone's a sinner, but there were people that were the poster children of sinners. And he went to their house and they all went, <gasps> and they got to talk about it and so forth like that and spread gossip and things and kind of go, he goes and he dines with tax collectors and prostitutes, Ugh, right? All these terrible people. That's what his vocation is. That intimacy, he said, I have come to heal the sick, not the well. Now, the, the irony is there's no well people. There's no healthy people. They're all sick. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, teachers of the law, they were actually sicker than the, what they considered the sinners because they had just lied to themselves. And yet that's the intimacy of what Christ demonstrates uh, in that. So here's what it really says. And I'm going to show you this in a second um, through another quote. God is hiding behind the masks. And I put it in quotes because it's just an image for us to imagine. The masks of our neighbors, those we serve and who serve us. Who serves us. All right? So God, this is that, that, that Gustav Wingren talks about, that God is hiding, right, in a sense, to reveal uh, something about himself. And that'll make sense in a minute. So God is hiding behind masks. He's hiding behind the masks of your neighbors. Because he intends to work through those neighbors, whether they're believers or not. He intends to hide behind and influence the world to every person on the planet. It, it's easier to do God's work when you trust God, when he is your Lord and Savior. Other than that, you might do good things. We had some neighbors when we lived in St. Louis uh, that were Mormon. And uh, Mormons believe very, very uh, uh, vehemently that uh, their good works are going to benefit them. Right? That's the point. That's the why they go out at a certain age and proselytize and door to door and things like that. Because by doing those things, they believe that God will reward them. Very, very much about works uh, righteousness. I can tell you, living next door to Mormons is wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. They will do anything for you. Right? And I mean that they're just super, super friendly. At least that's been my experience. That they're kind of like, what can I do for you? Let me, let me loan this to you. Oh, I'll provide that. Let me do this. No, no, take this. Right? Because they're, they're motivated. But now, is God still doing good through those Mormon neighbors? Yes. Right? Now, it, there's, there's something getting lost in the translation a little bit because what motivates that goodness is not necessarily God's glory. Okay? And, and loving your neighbor. But they were loving my neighbor. That was me. Right? And, and so there's still things happening. When somebody does something good in this world, you watch the news, prayerfully they have a story once in a while about something good. Right? And somebody says, that's really good. It doesn't mean that they're a believer. But it does mean that God is hiding behind that mask of that person and still able to influence this world sometimes in positive ways. But I want you to understand that God is working behind everything. And when we are mindful of it, there's, there's more extraordinary possibilities. If we're not mindful of it, it tends to kind of be hampered and just kind of remains ordinary. We do good things that we just, that was a good thing, okay? And we kind of go at a boy. Uh, instead, we don't really see God's glory in it because God isn't elevated. Um, here's an irony, um, and maybe a dichotomy is the right way to say it. God is hiding in order to be close. It, that seems... Uh, that seems almost opposite. But, it, but I want you to understand, this is important for us to kind of contemplate the reason that he hides behind masks. Um, we're going to explain this, but I'll tip my hand a little bit. What do you think would be your response of what little or much you know about God in the Old Testament and so forth if God appeared right now in this room in his glory? Yeah. We'd be in trouble. Right? We, we would absolutely be in trouble. Not, not because God is dangerous, but because he is holy, he is perfect, and he's God. Okay? And, and, uh, and, and those are... So, so I want you to imagine, if Jesus appeared like he appeared in his lifetime in this room, would we be in trouble? Not in the same way. See, because Jesus hid his divinity, right, beneath his flesh. He looked like a Jewish guy. Right? And yet he was absolutely 100% God. The, the stories today demonstrated in the gospel. The demons cried out, Aha, Lord Jesus of Nazareth, we know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? He goes, Quiet. He said it kind of rude. I'm not going to say it uh, like, like he would have meant it. Um, and so he said that phrase that my mom says we're not supposed to say. Right? Be quiet and get out. And he just gets out. Right? That's the power of the word of God. It's, it's lurking there in Jesus of Nazareth. It's always there. 
right? Uh, and, and yet it can express itself at times, okay? But otherwise, he just looks like a Jewish guy hiding behind the mask of flesh. Um, however, God the Father talks about it when uh, Isaiah had the vision in the temple and so forth, the glory of God and his robes are flowing everywhere. And, and there's time that Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he's like, I can't look at you. I can't see your glory. Um, I'm doomed. I'm wrecked if I do. And, and, and God didn't say, no, 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 it's okay. He said, you're right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk by and you can see the back of me as I walk away. But you can't gaze upon me directly because of my holiness, right? And so God hides right, behind those masks, as it were, of his people in his creation and so forth, so that he can be close to us, right? He said, I want to have a very personal interaction. That's why, um, you know, uh, Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah, when, when the Son of Man comes uh, with a couple of angels, would believe, and talks with Abraham. The reason he's talking with Abraham is because God had to hide himself. I'm going to come in a form that you can interact with, because if I came as is, you're doomed. You can't exist with me, not because of your sinfulness, right? Or because of your sinfulness, you can. And, uh, and, and to be able to understand. So let me give you a, something that uh, somebody wrote from uh, Luther on the hidden God. God hides in order not to be found where humans want to find God, but God hides in order to be found where God wills to be found, all right? So it's not where you want to find him, it's where God wants to be found. Such is the game that must be played with such seekers after God. The reason that the Father must hide behind masks of creation, uh, the larva day, that's the, the, uh, the Latin of that, is that God refuses to abandon the world or its sinners. So the reason that God hides, he doesn't want to leave us alone. <clears throat> He hides behind the church because he doesn't want to. If, if God comes as is, right, that's to the ruin of the world once again. It would destroy everything, right? Not that God is out of control because of his glory. So don't think of it. He has this attribute that he can't reign in. But because he's God, this is the reason that Adam and Eve had to leave Eden. They didn't leave Eden because they were in trouble. We often just kind of go, there's your punishment. You have to get out. No, you can't stay here because you're broken and sinful and this garden is still paradise. And if you're here, it'll wreck everything. So you cannot be here. In fact, to keep you and protect you, I'm going to put an angel at the entrance so that you can't wander back in in some way, right? And, and so God's glory is just part of his identity. It's not something he's like, I can turn it on and turn it off. It's who he is. And so if he came in his glory, we could not exist. We couldn't stand, couldn't exist in his presence, which is why Jesus came to die for our sins so that one day we would stand righteous before God so that that sin wouldn't be the condemnation that would weigh on us and God go, I can't let you into heaven. Your sin is a problem. You cannot be with me in my presence with sin. You can't. It is like oil and water. I'm holy, you're not. And so Jesus comes to fix our not problem. And when he does that, we claim it, and then God the Father says, come on in. This is what I've been missing, right? This perfect communion with my creation, okay? And, and so God hides in order to be found. That, that seems like a strange statement, so let me kind of flush that out a little bit. Some of the more grand masks that I can kind of relate to here today of God include creation. Creation is a mask. I don't mean just people in creation, but all of creation. Uh, it says in Romans, says it also in Matthew, um, that uh, God's invisible qualities, I even go as far as saying his hidden qualities, such as his divine presence and his power and so forth, are clearly seen in creation, right? When you see, um, I, I, I took some time on, uh, on Wednesday when it was snowing. And uh, I was outside, and I had a, a dark uh, sweatshirt on, and uh, and I remember just going out there, and the, the snow was falling, and, and some of the snowflakes fell on my dark sleeve, and you got to see the shape of snowflakes. Okay, now that's just God showing off, <laughs> right? They could be just little beads of ice, and just dink, dink, and just pile up. Nope, I'm just watching one after the other fall, and go, that one's different than that one. That one's that one's small. That one, that one's beautiful, and and so forth. That is God going, ta da, <laughs> right? That is God kind of going glory, okay, power, right? And it is amazingness. So when you look at it, you don't just go, wow, what a strange arrangement of ice crystals, 
right? Look how the molecules of water as they froze create these random things. No, it, it is a proclamation of God's glory. Now, you can reject it, but I'm here to tell you that doesn't count. Because God says, my creation is clearly showing you the evidence of God. That is a mask. When you look out today and see that beautiful sunshine out there today. Now, I know every day is a gift. But there is just something about beautiful days. Isn't it interesting that you even know what a beautiful day is? I have never had an argument with somebody on an overcast rainy day going, man, it's beautiful out there. <laughs> Not once have I had somebody argue. Now they'll say, I get that I need rain. I get that we need these things. But I've never had somebody kind of arm wrestle me verbally about what beautiful is. They look at things and go, that's beautiful. Right? And that's God's mask. Right? It's hiding his glory behind it. But you can find it. It's not impossible, but it is not the actual glory of God out there. It reveals it. Um, the flesh of Christ. Tremendous mass. He looked like a Jewish guy. A Jewish man. Normal, ordinary, nothing that would draw you to him. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, handsome. He wasn't charismatic necessarily. He might have been um, you know, to attract people to talk to him. But the point was is that he looked like a normal human being, and yet the very total presence of God was there within him at the same time. Incredible mask. Um, the Word of God. You open up that Bible. It's words. It's ink. It's paper. It's syntax. It's grammar. And yet at the same time, it is the very voice of God. It is, a, it is a text like no other book. There is no other book that even compares to it. And I don't mean just its uh, organization. I mean what it is. It looks like a book. And it is not only a book, because at the same time, it's the very voice of God, a brilliant mask of God. And the sacraments and the vocation, we've talked about, those are some of the great masks of God. So, just to be clear, God hides in order to be revealed. Okay? He hides in order to be revealed. I want you to imagine something. This is as, as pedantic as I can make it. Um, when a little baby is sitting maybe in a high chair or in a, in a seat or on the couch or something like that, and you play peekaboo with them. This is just the most rudimentary game. You stand in front of them and you go, you haven't gone anywhere, okay? And yet to the baby, this is, this is significant. I can't see your face or your eyes. And then you go, peekaboo, right? Now, this is, I feel really silly, all right? But the point is, is this is what God does, right? He's like, I'm hiding, but I'm, I'm right here. You just gotta look. And, and I reveal myself. So even though I'm hiding, I'm really close. I'm right up with you, and I can just do this periodically. When you read the word and you go, oh, man, that's God going peekaboo, okay? When you get that wafer this morning, and you get that, and you take it in, and, and God does peekaboo. That's me. I'm there. When you, when you hear something in the sermon, I pray this happens often, where the Holy Spirit suddenly goes ding, and that little fader switch goes up a little bit, or maybe the switch all the way up, and suddenly God goes, do you hear that? And you go, yeah, peekaboo, right? God was not far away. It wasn't a, a long-distance message and, and things like that. He was right there, and he just goes, ta-da, there it is, okay? So he hides in order to be revealed. He hides because he wants to be intimate with us. Let's keep going. So God is hidden for us for this, for this reason, and I was, I'm kind of alluding to that. One is we cannot know him fully. Okay? Uh, would somebody look up 1 Corinthians 13, 12? For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So, the, so Paul is talking about, he said, right now we know God in part. Now it doesn't mean that, that um, we're somehow ignorant or naive or unable. Um, what it means is you cannot know God in his totality. Because he's holy, because he's divine. Um, if, if, not if, when you and I have, have asked God the question, I don't understand this. Explain to me why this is happening this way. You know what that's a, an example of? You not being God. God, I don't understand what you're doing here. And God would be like, yeah, <laughs> right. I, I get that. That's, that's a statement, not a question. You can't know what I know. You can't understand what I understand. You're stuck like this. You and I live one minute after another, right? One moment at another. God sees it all at the same time. That makes my brain hurt, by the way, okay? He sees everything, and he sees always, and, and 
thank to him that he does. Otherwise, my prayers are pretty pointless to say, God, would you help me with this that's coming up? He's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see. Right? Instead, you know what's great about it is I kind of said, Lord, I'm wrestling with this. And I don't know if this is going to happen or this is going to take place. Here's the great thing. God's already there. So the one I'm talking to is already just kind of sitting on the porch, so to speak, waiting for me to show up, waiting for me to arrive and kind of go, come on up here. Let's talk about this. And you're like, you were there when I prayed. And so you knew. And so there was confidence and conviction that, that you knew what was going to happen. And, and man, that's great because I didn't. I walk through with blinders. I can only see as far out in front of my end of my nose. And, and we see this. And so what we understand is that God is hidden from us. One, we can't know him fully because he's God. Okay, so that's just a fact. Secondly, this is what I was talking about. It's for our safety. We cannot know God fully in this life. It would be to our ruin. Somebody grab Exodus 33. I referenced this a little while ago. Well, as he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That's pretty blunt, right? You cannot see me. You cannot stand in my presence. If you do, you won't live. And it's because of sin. It's not God's punishment. It's not God being mean. It is just him being God. And you can't stop being God. One of the things I often teach in my new members class, the reason that Jesus is True God and true man. That's fancy words for being. He is 100% God and 100% man. The reason we say he's 100% God is he can't stop being God. It's not something you just kind of go, I'm going to take this off, take off my Godness and hang it in the closet while I'm walking around here on earth. He's like, you can't change who you are and what you are. You're God. And you're completely God. You're not a third God, right? That there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and everybody's a third. No, you're completely God at the same time, three persons, which, again, makes our human brains hurt because we cannot fully know God. That's one of those examples. But it's also for our safety. So God hides not to play a game, not to be, um, if you know the books, uh, Where's Waldo? Right, those crazy books where you look and there's all this busy uh, uh, drawing all over the place and all this red and white coloring that's all in the detail and you got to find that crazy little Waldo with the glasses and the striped hat, isn't it? Or striped shirt? Yeah, striped shirt. There you go. And uh, you got to find him. And yet there's all these things that look like him. So you just do this. That is not God. God is not saying, hey, if you follow all the hints and you follow all the the, the evidence and stuff like that, you might see me, you might come in contact with me, but you got to work hard. See what that becomes all of a sudden? Works, right? Do things, and then maybe I'll reveal myself. He says, actually, I'm all over the place. I'm everywhere, and, uh, and you just got to lean in. The greatest place, however, where God hides in order to be revealed is the cross. <laughs> it always comes back to Jesus. So the greatest place that God hides is the cross. That's the greatest place where the ordinary... In fact, I would even go as far as saying the heinous of the cross becomes extraordinary, becomes miraculous, because there is where God revealed himself. And, and what did he reveal? Love and mercy and truth and promise. Um, in fact, the reason it's so strange is because it's the last place you'd expect to see God. That's one of the things that when I talk with people that truly do not know God or know much about the Bible, when I tell them who Jesus is and what he did for us, the cross is the biggest surprise for them, right? To be able to say, so you believe that your God died on something as heinous as a cross. That's awful. Why would you believe that? And I'm like, it's not that I created it. That's what's been communicated to us. That's what Christ was willing to do because of my sin and because of your sin. That's what he was willing to face. Christ was not willing to face a paper cut for us or, uh, or an inconvenience. He was willing to, to deal with the most brutal, uh, the most painful, the most awful way to die um, that, that had been created by man at that time. And, and said, so that's how much he loves us. So it's not so much the ugliness of it, but what he accomplished through it, what he demonstrated through it. But that's the last place you'd expect him, which is why it's so hidden. When you look at it, you can get lost in the agony and the angst of the cross and miss out that it's God doing it for you, right? We see how serious God is through the cross, how serious he is about sin, right? When you realize this, this has always been something that we all struggle trying to wrap our heads around, that Jesus Christ died for all sin. 
Now, most of us in our pride and our ego, we claim, well, thank goodness that we're not that sinful, so we didn't add a lot to his shoulders, right? Which, not true. I mean, just just being, being regular people, just add up, you think, in your head what your sins have been so far in this life. Right, I'm 54, right? I, I don't know if I could tabulate how many happen in a day, but just do the math and kind of go, Jesus died for all those sins, right? And all people of all time, all their sins. And so when you see the ugliness and, and the horror of the cross, it also shows you that God is absolutely serious about paying the price for those sins, right? And that's what we see. So that's some of the things that are revealed to the cross, even though the cross seems like the most unlikely place, a place that I actually, in my own selfishness, wish God wasn't there. I don't want him on the cross. I don't want him to suffer like he had to suffer there. I think that is a horrible way to die, right? And I don't want anybody, certainly someone who claims to be my Savior and Lord, to go through that. And yet, because he did, then I go, why? And the why is answered here, because God is really serious about sin. Um, God is also revealed in creation, right? We talked about that, so let me just kind of flush that out just a little bit more. In creation, but it's always through the lens of the Word. And the reason I add that, the Word is, is being the Bible. It could be Jesus, but, but most generally here I'm referring to the Bible. Because people can look at creation and look at the world around them and come to the wrong conclusions. When I was a Boy Scout, I was really interested in Indian lore. Uh, in Michigan, there were the Ojibwa Indians, and and uh, and I was very interested in in how they um, how they lived, how they existed, but what they understood about their gods, their deities, and they learned those things from looking at creation, right? They had a sky god and a water god and a land god, and the the animals were their brothers, and you know, in, in creation and so forth. But without the Bible, all they received was the natural revelation that God exists, and they got it wrong, right? Because without the word, without Jesus and the explanation of the revelation of God's word, you miss some of the really important details. Like if you look at creation, and you and I look outside, but you and I are part of it. When we look at creation, you will come to certain conclusions. You will come that there is a God, without a doubt, okay? Now, you don't know the name of that God. You do know that the world is broken, all you got to do is look around, see some roadkill on the road, and you kind of go, world's broken. There's disease and there's suffering. That's mostly what you're going to learn from creation. And maybe that God, not maybe, but definitely, that God is a God of diversity, right? So there's variance and stuff in creation. That's what you'll learn. But I don't know that I am in trouble because of my sin. I just know that sin exists. I know that God is great uh, and so forth. But the Bible, which is that next revelation, right? So um, if I were to show you that, uh, we don't have to look up Romans 1.20. Natural revelation, that's what I see in nature. And spiritual revelation, or scriptural rather, revelation uh, is the Bible. We need both of those. Creation tells us there's a God, and the scripture tells us who it is and what he's done. So we need both of those. So if you only have a natural revelation, so this is why we go to other groups of people, other people groups that have not received the word of God because natural revelation has taught them certain things and at times very wrong things. Romans and the Greeks, what did they learn? Everything is controlled by gods. When something happens, the gods are at work and they're fickle and they're, uh, they're novel at times and they interact with us in sporadic ways and so forth. How did they know that? Well, because when there was droughts, when there was wars, when there was an eruption from a volcano, when there was a, a disease that swept through, the gods must be angry. They just look at the evidence. But until there was a message from God's word, which by the way, has been out since Genesis 1. The message did not just come with Jesus. The message has been here since the beginning. But if you leave that message in the dust, then all you have is natural revelation. You're going to come to a lot of different conclusions until somebody else comes up and tells you something like Buddha or Vishnu or Muhammad, right? Or Joseph Smith or L. Ron Hubbard, right? All right. Look that one up if you're unfamiliar. God is also revealed in the incarnation. So just kind of flush that out. See, in Christ, God is hidden. Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about that. You don't have to look it up, but it talks about how uh, that Christ is hidden in God, but he's hidden so that he can be revealed. 
So when you and I live out and, and in the word of God live out that Christian faith with the Holy Spirit and you learn about who Jesus is, we lean into his word. The reason that we often preach and teach on the gospel of Jesus Christ is because in Christ you see God. And, and part of our responsibility is to pull back that mask when God reveals in his word, what about God do I need to know? And Jesus was here to reveal those things. In three and a half years, he revealed enough about God himself and his father and spirit and so forth, enough to rescue us from doom, from condemnation. And so as we lean into that, that's why we teach. It's why we preach. It's why we spend time in the word. It's why we allow ourselves access through prayer for the Holy Spirit to work in us so that we can learn more and more about this God through Christ. All right. Um, one of the important things here we talk about Christ being hidden is trust what you read. Um, and I say that, and the word is in parentheses because that's what I'm talking about reading, not reading anything else. In fact, don't trust anything else you read. Um, and I don't mean that in, in no ways, but not when it comes to God. His word is, is superior. His word is alone. Um, and so I often have people ask, you know, if I read commentaries on the Bible, if I read the catechism and things that we use as a teaching tool, those are all referencing the Bible. They don't stand alone as this is my opinion, um, which is one of the reasons I hope you see it loud and clear. Um, when I preach here and, and when pastors preach in Lutheran churches, um, they better put you to the word. They better say, open this up, look at it, read it, follow up. Here's some references. Look at it. Um, not just kind of, hey, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you what I think. Because one of the dangers in our world today, and it's gotten worse, is trust what you feel. That's dangerous. Because what we feel is fraught with sin, right? Our selfishness, our ego, our smallness of what we think. God is also revealed in vocation, right? So let me just kind of highlight that. That's the whole title of this uh, Bible class, vocation. And uh, it's kind of a difference. I'm not going to go into this a lot. i uh, touch on this a little bit next week. It's kind of the difference of looking through glory glasses and cross glasses, and to give you what I mean by those, I'm just going to put it underneath. Glory glasses is what man sees. What brings glory to you? Okay, What you do and what you are in this world. Cross glasses is what God sees. I want to look at this world the way God looks at it. Which means I want to look at my neighbor and say, they are a mask of God that is meant for us to interact so that the goodness of God, the glory of God can be revealed. If I help my neighbor because I want a pat on the back, that's just for my own glory. Those are the glory glasses, right? I want to be known and recognized for my good works, okay? Instead, I want to see what God sees. And, and as it says, uh, I, I use this example, I think, last week, um, where Samuel came and was going to um, uh, anoint uh, David as king, and he went down and down and down, and they're like, well, how come none of these were anointed? He said, is it you have any other boys? And like, I got David, the runt out in the you know, field taking care of the, the lambs. And he says, bring him in. And I'm, I'm, he's going to be the one more than likely. And uh, they're like, well, but he's, he's the youngest. And, and he says, God sees differently than we see. He looks at the heart, right? And that's how we want to see. Um, we see what God reveals to us. Okay, that's one thing when we use his eyes. We see what God reveals to us. We only see what he wants us to see. Anything else than that is you. Some of my prayers recently, we've been struggling with some things, just wrestling with some things that God's doing. And, uh, and it's a real challenge to be able to say, God, is this you or is this me? Because I have an opinion um, and I have an emotion that gets wrapped up that you kind of go, God, is this my own desire and is it kind of me finding my way through this? Or is this you pointing my way through it? And that means lean in, right? Keep asking, keep searching. Um, he sees love being carried out. When you look through the eyes of God, you see through those cross glasses, we see love being carried out through the world around us as we serve our neighbors. And I love this one. Even if your heart isn't in it, because you are a mask of God, his is. Right? So if you help somebody, you pull up on the side of the highway, right, that off-ramp, somebody's there panhandling, you're like, if I help them, they're just going to take that money and buy alcohol. Do you know what happens if you help them? The heart of God is being expressed. Now, it doesn't mean that we're to be careless and, and be poor stewards. But sometimes when your heart isn't in it, don't let that stop you. Because the very presence of God is within all of us. You are a mass through which God's glory is meant to impact this world. Do you know how useless we would be if we said, we're only going to do things when I feel like it? I'll tell you, I wouldn't show up every Sunday. Right? 
I, I mean that sinfully, right? I'm not, not arguing, but it, it, the, the point is, if we just said, I just don't feel like it to do it. I don't feel like loving my spouse. I don't feel like caring for my kids. I don't feel like being friendly to the bodies of believers when we gather together as church, right? Even if your heart isn't in it, do it. I, I used to have a professor in uh, the seminary, Joel Beerman. He said, do it out of obedience and let your heart catch up. I was like, that's a good way of thinking. You talk about tithing like that sometimes. He goes, just tithe and let your heart catch up. Do what's commanded of you. Love one another. Pray for your enemies. Do it out of obedience and let your body, your heart catch up. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for our vocations, all the ways that you intend to use us to love our neighbors. Um, Lord, I pray, use us this week. Work through us. Um, Lord, may we see in big, uh, bright neon letters, this is an opportunity to love this person. And, and, and it's not always the obvious. It's total strangers. It's people I've been in conf conflict with, um, unexpected uh, interactions. But Lord, use me to love them with your love. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. <laughs>